Hello, everybody. Today, we are lucky enough to be with Blair Beasley and Lisa Lilienthal. Blair is on the core research team for Drawdown Georgia and is also the director of climate strategies at the Ray C. Anderson Foundation, which is funding Drawdown Georgia. Previously, Blair worked on the Georgia Climate Project leadership team, the Bipartisan Policy Center's Energy Project, Resources for the Future, and Net Zero Solutions. Lisa is a principal leading the purpose practice at a company called Dialogue, which is an engagement strategy firm for organizations on a mission. Lisa is heavily involved with Drawdown Georgia's content and community and helped bring Drawdown Georgia and Group It together to launch a crowd solving platform, which I personally am very excited to hear more about. So Blair and Lisa, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having us. This is great should be a fun conversation. So we will be discussing all the ins and outs of Drawdown Georgia. My hope here is to share the story of this project, how it started, the strategy behind it, and what's been working well so far. And I really hope that people listening to this can can learn from this discussion and potentially bring these insights or roadmaps back to their own cities or states, or at least plant these seeds to help start get things going. But I want to start by taking a step back and hearing more about your climate journeys, especially how they got started, because I think that's always really interesting. Like, personally, I love hearing those. I think people enjoy hearing, like, why you went down this path in the first place, why it's important. So uh, let's start with Blair and then go to Lisa. And my question is just, when did you decide to work on climate and why? Sure. Well, thanks again for having us. I had, you know, I'm not sure if there's a typical path into this field, but I'm pretty sure mine's a little atypical. So I actually started my career as a journalist working at small and mid-sized newspapers in the Southeast. And it was there that I really got this really great deep education into the power of public policy, as well as the impacts of a changing climate. So I was actually interning right out of undergrad at a TV station in Roanoke, Virginia. And as the intern had the very, very early shift, so got there before daybreak. And this was a day in August in 2005. And I was in the newsroom as images started coming in from New Orleans of the levees breaking um, during Hurricane Katrina. It was a really powerful moment for me personally. Um, A few years later, I was working as a newspaper reporter in Jackson, Mississippi, and many of those same Katrina evacuees had to flee to Jackson, Mississippi when another storm was coming. And so I had this moment where I decided that I really wanted to engage in the climate crisis in a more direct way than I was. So I actually changed careers from being a journalist and enrolled in a public policy graduate program at Georgetown University and shifted to focus on climate policy and climate solutions. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah. So and what about you, Lisa? Yeah. So this is how I got on this path is one of my favorite stories of my life to tell because I was just really, really fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. So about 10 years before Blair was in her newsroom looking at Katrina pictures in 1995, I was introduced to Ray Anderson who is the namesake of the foundation. And for those in your audience who may not know Ray's story, he founded a commercial carpet company in the early 70s in Georgia. And he brought to Georgia this really great technology for carpet tile that the United States didn't have yet. So he was a big, bold entrepreneur. He was a captain of industry. And when I met him, he was 60 years old and kind of at the top of his game. He drove up in his Bentley. You know, he lived in the most beautiful part of Atlanta, had this beautiful family. There was nothing about him not to admire. He was a very respected graduate of Georgia Tech, which is, you know, in Atlanta is is just a a real institution. And when I met him, he was about six months after he had a big epiphany around the impact that his carpet manufacturing company was having on the environment. So this man who should have been thinking about retirement, he used to say, I should be thinking about chasing little white balls, you know, playing golf. He was really at a point in his life where I think in the back of his mind, he was really thinking about what his legacy was going to be. And while while he had lots of things to be proud of and, and this huge billion dollar business, global business that he had built, and like I said, this beautiful family, I think there was a nagging sense of legacy in the back of his mind. And 
through a really serendipitous circumstance. He was handed a book by the author Paul Hawken, who many of you might know as a very prolific author um, who writes a lot about um, climate impacts and also now in in the current times, um, climate solutions, including the book Drawdown, which Drawdown Georgia came out of. But at the time, he was handed that book in the mid-90s, and it was really, he called it a spear in the chest. It was The Ecology of Commerce, one of Paul's earlier books, and he called it a spear in the chest. It was a moment that changed his life, then the course of his life and the course of his company forever. He was, he always said that he was convicted as a plunderer of the environment, and he saw very clearly through Paul's words the not just the impact that business and industry were having on the environment, but also, really importantly, the potential that business and industry have to course correct. As, and to, and he felt like he and Paul both feel like um, that business and industry are the most powerful institution on earth in terms of being able not you know not governments, not nonprofits not religious organizations, to turn the tide on climate. So that moment in time was really prescient for him. And then it was just just sheer circumstance for me that I wound up working on a PR team, actually just doing the open house for a new corporate office they had moved into. Met Ray, we really kind of hit it off and ended up spending about 17 years after that working at his side and helping him articulate his message. I helped him publish two books. You know, he was a prolific writer and speaker. And so supporting him and getting his message out there was really just, you know, the real work of my life. And I'm sorry, I know that's a long story, but that's that's the the road that led me. So after Ray passed away in 2011, um, the foundation has um, kept me busy um, working on on their different initiatives. And when it came time to think about and launch Drawdown Georgia, which was such is such a beautiful full circle moment, right? Because Paul and his original book that influenced Ray and now Paul and the Drawdown movement have um, influenced the whole world, but but the foundation especially to think about how they could regionalize the really important work that was done by the Drawdown Fellows. That is an amazing story. <laughs> Two amazing stories. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm hoping you can both take me from from those points to Drawdown Georgia. What led you both to get involved with that? And I guess, how did it start? I'd love to hear the backstory a little bit. Yeah, I'm going to say that my story with Ray is what brought me to the moment of being of being brought into the to the but Blair has a, a great um, perspective on on how it all got started. Sure. So I can tell you a little bit about how I came to it, and then maybe Lisa, we can we can both unpack a little bit about how Drawdown came to be. So um, I'm originally from Atlanta, and so about two years ago, after spending um, ten years working on federal climate policy in DC, um, I moved back and ended up joining a really great team at Emory University, um, consulting with them on two related climate projects. Um, The first, which we can talk about in a little bit, is the Georgia Climate Project, which just brings universities in the state together um, to really try to address two foundational questions, which is what does a changing climate mean for Georgia? What can we do about it? And the other was Drawdown Georgia, um, which is what we're here to talk about today. And it's really grounded in research, which Emory was helping to lead. And I'll just note that both of those were funded in large part by the Anderson Foundation. So um, I had gotten to know the foundation through that work um, on the research team for Drawdown and through the Georgia Climate Project. And so at the beginning of this year, came on board full time to the foundation um, as their director of climate strategies to help move Drawdown from this research project into what it's growing into now, which is much more of a movement where that's really founded in the research, but goes much much beyond, um, much beyond a research project. So that's how I came to it. Yeah, and I think it's valuable at this moment just to kind of talk a little bit about what drawdown means for those in your audience who might not yet be familiar with that. That is that, a great idea. That term, and also the, the the larger global movement that that drawdown Georgia is part of. Do you want to talk about that, Blair? Sure. So so drawdown refers to this moment in time. Um, it's a concept, really, where emissions 
rates are stopping to rise in the atmosphere, carbon emissions are stopping to rise and actually start to decline. And that idea was really founded by Project Drawdown, which was first that New York Times bestselling book um, that was edited by Paul Hawken, as Lisa was mentioned, and is now this like really wonderful nonprofit organization. And so what Project Drawdown did is they identified 100 climate solutions that globally would allow the world to reach that state of drawdown. And it's this very inspiring list of solutions. It includes some of the you know, traditional engineering solutions like wind and solar power, as well as social solutions like educating more women and girls. So it's incredibly inspiring. It, I was inspired by it. It's a solutions first framing to climate mitigation. But there's one thing that you can't cannot do with their list, which is because it takes this really global perspective, it doesn't provide this roadmap for any particular locality about what that city or state or region should do to reduce its own emissions. So it's this inspiration, but not necessarily a handbook for change. And so Drawdown Georgia was created to provide that local roadmap for Georgia, that translation from Project Drawdown to what we can be doing in the state today to make the most um, emissions reduction reductions impact this decade. And I think one thing that's worth noting is that the drawdown work, the, the original Global 100 Solutions, um, they those solutions have, it's the intention was to identify solutions that already exist, solutions for which no further innovation or discovery needs to happen. And, and solutions for which we only need to scale them. And I think that is, you know, there's a couple of really beautiful things about it. One of the things being that it's solution-based and the other being that it, 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 it we can do it right now. We don't need anything else to start doing it except for the will and, and the funding in most cases, you know, to scale solutions. And so the idea that there's these, this list of 100 out there and all you have to do is localize that to give your community or your state or your region a roadmap, I think is just, um, we're so lucky that John Lanier saw, John Lanier, who's the executive director of the Racy Anderson Foundation, that he saw that potential to exist for Georgia. And the idea that Georgia, which up until really recently was considered a fairly conservative state and not particularly, you know, pro-environment, pro, pro-climate solutions. Um, and, and all that's changing. And so this moment in time where we are right now to capture sort of the hearts and minds and the imaginations of the, of the people in Georgia, the companies, um, the, um, the farmers, the, you know, everybody in between who has the potential to, who has those solutions in their hands, one of our, our 20 solutions in their hands and really only needs to be inspired by this vision. I think it's a really powerful story. That is an incredibly helpful overview. Um, and it really speaks to, because I, I read that book, you know, a few years ago or whenever, whenever it came out, it was really important for my, you know, understanding of this issue. And I think it has really helped shift the conversation towards, okay, what can we do, which is exactly where we need to be. Um, but I had the same, the same question. I was like, okay, this is the global stuff. What does it mean for where I live? Or what about this region? Like, it's got to be different for different places. So it's super exciting. This is part of why I wanted to have you both on and, and feature Drawdown Georgia, because you're localizing this really important work. So thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. And I think to, to take a step back before we dive into... Drawdown Georgia specifically, I'd like to hear more about, I think it's the Georgia Climate Project that you'll get into, but I'd love to hear how is climate change affecting Georgia right now and what kind of impacts are you looking looking at, what is being projected for the future? I'm happy to take that. Um, you know, we talk a lot as we, one of the pillars of Drawdown Georgia is really to grow the conversation. And for many people, that's really grounding them on this is not a problem for the future, but this is what we're seeing now. So we spend a lot of time talking to people about what does a changing climate mean for Georgia? 
um, one of my colleagues used to frame it in a way that I always find really helpful when having this conversation, which is um, based on these three W's, which is on average, thing, things are warmer, weirder, and worse. So in Georgia, you know, 2019 was the warmest year on record since observations began, I believe, in 1895. So the Atlanta metro area experienced 91 days with temperatures above 90 degrees that year. And we just expect the heat to keep on coming. So Georgia currently averages um, about 20 dangerous heat days a year, where the heat index is 104 or greater. And by 2050, it's projected that the state will see more than 90 of these days a year. <clears throat> and so here in Georgia, we actually get all of the major impacts that you think about, which is kind of the weirder in this framework, which is, you know, we get really strong downpours, regular 100 year floods, droughts, more powerful hurricanes and wildfires. So it really spans the board here. Um, and so things on average are, are worse because of a changing climate. And we know that's true now. And unfortunately the projections show it's increasingly true for future generations if we stay on this path. Um, one of the things I think is really important about this Drawdown Georgia framework is that we really have our, our eyes intentionally wide open about how this impacts all of our communities. And so we know that under-resourced communities are often hit hardest by these impacts. So this can include the ability of our energy burden customers to keep their homes cool during those heat waves. Um, we know that historically marginalized communities do not have equal access to trees and shade to help lower temperatures where they live, and that communities in these flood-prone areas in our cities and along the coasts are seeing the impacts first. You know, we have this colleague, um, Nataki Osborne-Jelks, who she wears many hats, including a professor at Spelman College and also a member of our Drawdown Georgia leadership team. And when she talks about this, she often says, you know, we're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. And I think that's particularly um, true here in Georgia. Yeah, that's, I love that. that's a beautiful, um, I love the weirder, warmer, and worse. Worse. And the, the same boat, the, the same storm, but not the same boat is a very apt way to put, put um, to capture the, the, the inequities that we know exist. We did a, we did a, an interesting um, project almost 20 years ago to um, tap a, a landfill in Georgia um, and take the methane um, to cap the landfill and, and um, take the methane to interface to one of the carpet manufacturing companies, um, factories that was in the adjacent community and it was enough methane or natural gas to, to fire a couple of boilers in the, um, in the factory. And so in, 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 you know, kind of sharing the story of that, which at the time was a really early mover project, um, for, for land, meth, uh, landfill methane capture, I learned that the landfill itself was located next to a poor, African-American community and that that was very, very typical. And so the folks who experienced poverty and hunger and even homelessness, even 20 years ago, um, their, their already difficult lives were really exacerbated by the air pollution from the landfill. So when we capped it to, to fire those boilers, it actually, you know, I'm, there was this huge environmental benefit, but, but what captured my imagination the most was how overnight almost we changed the trajectory of at least the public health in that community you know potentially because of um there would almost Im immediately be better at air quality so so thinking about climate solutions for not just for their environmental impacts but for their social impacts to me is is something that we we don't talk enough about and it, it's a really key and critical part of our ability to come together and crowd solve for climate in Georgia, because that concept brings so many more different and varied stakeholders to the table. You know, it's not just about environmentalists and technologists and engineers. It's also about, you know, public health people and, um, you know, social equity, people who are working in the social equity space. So, so that's just, when you get all those people around the table, that's a really dynamic an interesting conversation to be having. 
That is such a great story. And uh, I think you're spot on. It's, it's one of the things that we in the climate community need to really center more mm -hmm. is what Beth Sowin calls multi-solving or co-benefits. Yep. Yep. Like so many of these solutions help, you know, the planet and also people just simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, lifting people up while taking care of the longer term scary stuff um okay that that is awesome i'd love to now get into the specific solutions and the work that drawdown georgia is doing but maybe to to walk into that can either of you speak to the theory of change that's kind of driving all this Sure. I would say it's um, it's two things that I think are both really, really important to think about. One is kind of in a big picture way. I know Lisa has been talking about Ray Anderson a bunch. And while I, I didn't have the, the ability to meet him, I've now heard so many stories about him. And one of his main theories, I feel like, is, is really driving this, which is he was fond of saying that we should all brighten the corner where we are. And I feel like that is very central to what we're trying to do here. So we know that climate change is a global problem, but we are a state-centric effort working to do our part to reduce emissions in Georgia and to allow communities throughout the state to reap some of the benefits that we were just talking about, whether it's public health outcomes or jobs um, or the larger environment. And in order to accomplish that, we genuinely feel like the place to start is with the facts and with the research. So um, the second part of this, I would say, is that our effort is deeply rooted in, in research. And so research from researchers from many of our leading academic institutions here in the state, so Georgia Tech, University of Georgia, Emory, and Georgia State, we spent about 18 months on this collective research project aimed at identifying which of those 100 um, project drawdown solutions would make the most impact here in Georgia this decade. And just to give you like a really quick sense of like what it meant to evaluate those is we were really running all of those solutions through this series of filters. Like, is the solution relevant to Georgia? Is it technology and market ready to scale in the state this decade? Do we have local experience? Can it deliver enough carbon emissions to kind of give us that bang for the buck. And I'm happy to talk about this more later, but our kind of threshold was this 1 million metric ton or megaton um, limit. We also looked at whether it was cost competitive with other solutions in the sector, and then took a look at these other societal impacts that we've been talking about, which we called um, beyond carbon impacts, which is really that co-benefit analysis. We know climate solutions would have an impact on climate, on carbon, but what other impacts would they have? And how could we grow these solutions in ways that benefited our communities in terms of public health and equity, um, jobs, and the larger environment? <clears throat> so the result of that analysis was 20 solutions, these 20 high-impact solutions we talk about. And we've kind of bucketed them into five categories. So electricity solutions, transportation, food and agriculture, buildings and materials, and land sinks. So if you were to kind of dig into this list, you would see a lot of what I call like usual suspects, like rooftop solar and large scale solar. We have an amazing solar resource here in the state. So that quickly rose to the top of the list, um, as well as things like replacing conventional cars with um, either energy efficient vehicles or electric vehicles. And then there's also this kind of group of solutions that for many people are ones they may not suspect. This includes things like increasing composting um, or reducing food waste. And then I'll finally just note, um, before I hand it over to Lisa, that uh, most of our solutions are about decreasing sources of emissions. So we are just talking about solar, which could decrease like a fossil fuel generation plant or an electric vehicle, which would reduce gasoline. But we have this kind of group of solutions that are about land sinks that are instead focused on increased opportunities to actually sequester carbon naturally through soils and trees and vegetation. 
Um, so that includes things like planting and preserving forests, as well as protecting and growing our coastal marshes. So just a few fun Georgia facts of why these rose to the top here in the state is, you know, Georgia is um, actually the number one forestry state in the nation hmm. and has about 22 million acres of private timberland, which is more than any other state. And we also have more tidal marshes than any other state on the U.S. Atlantic seaboard. So both of those quickly like rose to the top of the of the list. Um so that's how we got to where we are. And then we made this really important pivot. So we released our, our research um, last fall, in the fall of 2020. And it was never intended to kind of stop there at a research project, but was always intended to be the moment of launch, like where we move from research to really doing something with this knowledge to make progress in the state. And so that's where we are now, working to grow the climate community in Georgia, serving as a source of nonpartisan trusted information for decision makers and other stakeholders and in a lot of different diverse ways lifting up partners to do more to address climate change um, in Georgia. That's awesome. So I'd love to know then how it's going so far. It sounds like you're still early in that transition or it was a recent transition, mm -hmm. but, uh, Maybe, Lisa, you can speak to how things have been since then and how things are looking. Absolutely. Yeah, so it was, um, we were lucky um, as a marketing consultant, we were able to to be sort of um, in the room where it happened, you know, when when the research reveals, you know, just started to progress, progress and keep coming and and you know, originally we thought maybe there'd be 10 solutions and then at some point there were 35 and then there were 21 and now, you know, 20, the magic number. And it was really great to observe that process that Blair just described and the way that the solutions were vetted and the really interesting academic perspectives that, that were a part of it. But ultimately, this didn't need to be about research. It needed to be about activation, right? So we um, had the good fortune of being um, together with a creative partner. Um, we had the opportunity to do the discovery work that we needed to do to think about how we would bring the brand to life and what some of the tenets of the brand would be. Um, of course, we wanted this to be a very inclusive brand. You know, we want everybody to feel like they have a seat at the table. A lot of that is driven by the Beyond Carbon and the co-benefits consideration, but also it's just, um, you know, there's, there's no way that this is going to happen without everybody at the table, right? The other thing we wanted the brand to do was be really participatory. We wanted people to see where they fit in, not just feel welcome, but also see where they could fit in. And so it was really important that we articulate not, not just what the solutions are, but um, that we tell stories of how it's already happening in Georgia. Because remember, our criteria for drawdown solutions is that they're already taking place. And so we're not trying to introduce something new. We're trying to take these things that already are happening and bring them together under a new umbrella. And that's the exciting part. And that's that's eventually what led us to the crowd solving opportunity. But as we were thinking about and considering the, the tenets of, of the brand, the other um, one of the other ones was that we be um, leader leader th that the the Racy Anderson Foundation be a leader, but not the leader, and not that we want to be a leaderless organization, but we want to be a leader full organization. And the and the sort of the the what that means is we want anybody who has a vision, a passion, an expertise, a solution, a, you know, a, a platform, whatever, money to fund things. We want all these people to feel like they can walk into this movement and lead, be, help lead us, you know, from their point, from where they, what the door they come in through, lead us all forward together. And so that's a really exciting proposition when you're a brand strategist. That's a lot of fun. And so we, we really loved, um, approaching the work, you know, with kind of those tenets. And then we also wanted to think about how we could make this accessible to everyone. And a lot of that has to do with really how we share information. So for example, Blair was talking about the threshold of 1 million metric tons of carbon. That was a consideration, 
And they started using some shorthand for that and calling it a megaton. And so then we started talking about, well, this can, you know, this can take, um, you know, three megatons off the, off the board. And then we, you know, of course, immediately realized as communicators, that doesn't mean anything to the average person. And so how can we, how can our brand help educate people also about, you know, some of these, um, maybe more academic concepts, maybe you want to say. Um, and so that you see that reflected in the website, which is drawdownga.org. There's a megaton explorer. So you see the state of Georgia on the homepage and you click on the dots that are around it. And it, the, the state image fills up with a solution and tells you what it would take to get to a megaton of carbon, for example, electric vehicles. Um, so in that way, we've made, I think, the the goals and the methodology for how we're calculating the ultimate vision that we have for 2030, um, how we're creating this roadmap. And I think that is is really beneficial to lots of people who are becoming involved in the movement. That's awesome. Can you, this can go to either of you, but can you tell me more about how you're accelerating these solutions? And if there's any wins that you're excited about that you've had so far? Any stories that come to mind? I would say that we are really starting to see people taking this and in their own authentic ways, working to use the research and the movement to like go further faster. So I'll give you um, maybe two examples. One is um, one of our partners at Georgia Interfaith Power and Light has been working with communities of faith across the state for many years on what they call their green teams, where they go in and they help congregations both to reduce their impact from their physical facility, their church or their synagogue or their mosque, but also through the whole congregation. Well, they took this drawdown model and they revamped their green teams. So now that they have Drawdown Georgia for congregations, and they're using this as a roadmap of like, what are the pillars that we should be helping our congregation work towards? Like what, when we think about what's most important, we now have this roadmap. So let's direct our congregations who want to lean in here to these areas. And so they've created trainings and are going um, around the state virtually and in person, helping congregations um, across different faith um, traditions to do Drawdown Georgia for their congregations. Another kind of one of these examples is, as I mentioned, there's kind of this cousin-sister relationship between Drawdown Georgia and the Georgia Climate Project. Many of the same people have worked on these two groups. Well, they are about to launch a Drawdown Georgia higher ed, where they are going to be raising up some of the best practices that are coming out of our leading institutions, academic institutions in the state, they're going to be creating curriculum where people can share curriculum about how to teach about climate solutions in the classroom and then to track how are our universities doing when it comes to their organizational footprints. And so I think we're finding, you know, this is a huge problem. Our goal as Drawn on Georgia is not to take it on ourselves completely, but instead to help other people go further faster. And we're really hopeful we see other people take that inspiration and run with it. That's awesome. So if there are some Georgians out there listening right now who want to get involved or are already working on a solution and might want to tap in and see how you guys can help, uh, what would you, what you, what would you say to them? What should they do? Well, the very first thing they need to do is come to our, our website and opt in, just drop an email address for us so that they can get into our universe um, of storytelling and, and communications. We have a Georgia Climate Digest that publishes every two weeks, and it is just an awesome little email in your inbox because you'll find in that email, you'll find the top news stories that are, that are, have broken in the past, you know, week and a half or so around climate solutions. So this is not an in, inbox full of doom and gloom. This is an inbox full of hope and, and really um, a signal for you that these are the things that are working in Georgia, because here's what's rising to the top from a news organization's perspective. So you'll have um, reports about new, um, new businesses come into Georgia from an economic development perspective. You know, one of the largest battery makers in the entire world is building a battery factor for that factory. So batteries for, you know, 
um, electric vehicles and solar storage, building a factory in Georgia and um, all the jobs and, and economic impact that that's going to have in addition to making Georgia you know, really recognizable as a leader in that kind of technology. And um, you'll have news about Bluebird School Buses, who a company down in Macon, Georgia, that is um, building and and already has on the road um, hundreds of electric vehicle, you know, electric powered school buses, and they're 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 selling them all over the country. In fact, I think they have more that. outside of Georgia than they have inside of Georgia right now that are on the roads. But I'm sure that will change really soon. And then you have stories about um, schools and companies that are doing their part, and so it's it's a great news digest. I really encourage um, anyone in Georgia who is hungry for this good news to subscribe to that um, newsletter. And of course, we also share a little bit about what's going on with us as well. Um, we have webinars, we have um, other ways that people can, you know, get together and learn. And um, so if you, if you could go to the news, go to the website and sign up for the newsletter, that's great. The other thing, and I don't know if you want me to talk about it yet, Ryan, but is, is really our crowdsolving community. And that's, yeah. that's the biggest Please opportunity. Please dive in. Okay. I'd love to hear about that. Okay. So when we were thinking about, as I talked earlier about the tenants of the brand that draw down Georgia and who we would be, that the idea that we could be inclusive and um, welcome everybody to the table. One of the things that that brought up is, is that, well, okay, well, there has to be a table, you know, where can, where can everybody come, come together and what does that look like? And around the same time we had become aware, um, my partner agency and I had become aware of a startup in Seattle that is founded by a former Microsoft executive, a very top tier Microsoft executive, a woman named Tammy Savage, and the company is called Group It. It's G-R-O-P-I-T. And what Tammy is creating is a platform where organizations, communities, um, people who have allied interests um, come, can come together and work together and solve problems. These are not teams that are already working together or that already have, for example, that table that they can sit around. This is built specifically for teams that are working in a disconnected way, but if they were connected, they could be more powerfully successful in, in solving the problems or achieving the goals that they're trying to achieve. So it's very intentionally built for, you know, a company um, sustainability executive and a CEO and a technologist and um, a research professor and a public policy expert and a city manager um, to come together and a farmer and a cooperative extension person to come together all around the same table and talk about the common um, achievements that they're experiencing, but also really importantly about the common challenges. So if you have, I know your audience, because your podcast is about crowd serving, your audience is probably pretty savvy, but the idea of what we always say is that if you've ever used Waze, the traffic app, then you're a crowd solver. And so this is, so our crowd solving community is like Waze for climate. So anybody who's on the road to climate solutions should be opting in and telling us about their projects and how they're getting it done, what it cost, who the experts are that they brought in, the challenges they, they ran into. Is there a funding challenge? Is there a zoning challenge? Is there a supply chain issue, which has happened a lot you know, lately because of COVID? And how did they solve that problem? And if they have a problem and they haven't solved it, they put it out to the community and say, hey, we're, we're, we're experiencing this challenge. Has anybody else you know, found a solution to it? So it's very early days. We're about six or seven months into the, the group it actually being on board. We have about 350 people and projects in there. Certainly there are more people and projects in Georgia than that number indicates. But we are finding that inside that community, people are beginning to become connected and to see the value if you're a solar engineer in being connected potentially to a farmer, <laughs> you know, and what and how how just knowing that this community exists and being able to um, track the project of some, track the project progress of somebody else's project might help you innovate in your own way in terms of scaling, and um, so it's it's really exciting and it's also um, a lot a, a big high touch um, sort of scenario. We have to sort of reach those individuals who have the ability 
to be um, to talk about the projects that they're doing. So this is not necessarily a man on the street kind of crowd solving situation. This is a person um, who who might be at the table in a boardroom or a C-suite or in some other managerial capacity that has the ability to tell us about the project at a very high level. And that doesn't mean there are not individuals in there who are doing some some big things, but ideally what who we've got in there are people who have the um, ability to speak to and about big challenges that big organizations are are handling. That is awesome. Um, and I definitely see a lot of parallels of what we're trying to do here at crowdsourcing sustainability. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think I'm going to be following this closely to see what lessons can be learned. Um, well, but and how... that, yeah, that's, that's the biggest thing that we would love to see happening. And a little bit of it's already starting to happen with Drawdown Georgia is the idea that other communities would come to us and say, hey, this seems great. How did you do it? And what I think is really beautiful about Drawdown Georgia is we are an open book, a major open source. We take calls from communities all over the country who are trying to, um, to do this so that potentially we might shortcut their way, you know, their, their way finding by yeah. sharing the research experience, the brand experience, the crowd solving experience, all of it. That is exactly what we need right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that leads me to something I was going to ask you a bit later, but it seems appropriate to ask now, what advice do you have for individuals who might want to start up uh, their own drawdown organization for their own city or state, just what would you say to them? What are some of the key steps or strategies to actually getting this going? So our hope is that we're going to make it easier for people to move forward with this kind of strategy, but that doesn't mean that it's completely easy to be really frank. I would say the two things I personally think are really important are one, that you're really place-based. I mean, the reason that this works is because it's place-based. And so um, we've talked to people in other states who are interested in doing a drawdown for their state. We've also talked with people who are interested in doing it at a city um, or so a sub-state level. And we'll see how how, how those experiences go. Um, The other thing that I think is really helpful is that it's based in research, and we're hoping that our research can be a launching pad to make other people able to replicate in a a quicker way. Um, So we're publishing um, open source um, journal articles for other academics and other states who may want to replicate the methodology. We have one journal article already out and another one that's forthcoming. And then we're also working on the foundation side to think about whether there is some storytelling and documentation that we can do from the funder community about what it looks like to fund this type of project um, in hopes that other funders will see the value and want to support efforts efforts in their community. So I would say place-based is important, research is important, and funding and finding a funder that's willing to go um, through this experience with the researchers is also really critical. Yeah, and I would add to that. I think that it's really important to to think about, especially in the in the South where Georgia is, but but I think really all over the country. If you're going to think about a movement like Drawdown, you really need to think about it in a in a very nonpartisan way. Um, I think when when Drawdown Georgia was first being conceptualized, we understood really early on that there were a couple of potential hurdles in Georgia. One is political, of course, because the conservative versus progressive um, divide is pretty strong in Georgia. And then the other is um, urban versus suburban versus rural, and which is all, all a very big factor. And in Georgia, a lot of times people in the rural communities think about something happening in Atlanta as something that's not particularly relevant to them, um, and or or that things that happen in Atlanta, since it's the state capital and and you know the more metro area, something that they just aren't interested in, or that is going to have a negative impact for them potentially. So, being aware of those, um, just from a 
a communications perspective and and thinking about who you want your brand to be when it comes to those different audiences and how you can bridge those divides. Um, I think being solutions focused and being place based and 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 is is really helpful. One thing that we're working really hard on is telling stories of people out in the in the, the across the whole expanse of the state. And a lot of progress is happening in the metro area. But it's also true that other um, cities in Georgia are doing some amazing things. A lot of really interesting stuff has happened in the rural communities. Blair talked earlier about the state being so heavily forested and all of the work that's being done in the forestry world. It's also true that a lot is happening in the food and agriculture sectors that that is climate solutions based. And those are um, really important when it comes to um, thinking about how to invite people into your movement. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. Um, So in terms of, I guess, like very first steps, if someone listening, you know, whatever city or state they're in, if they hear this, you mentioned a study that came out and there's another one on the way. Would that be a good place to start and figure out how to actually get the research done? Uh, What the solutions available are? Like, I guess my question is, how do you begin that process? And then once that has begun, what is kind of the next thing, like specifically like kind of nitty gritty details that, that they should be trying to do? I would say step one is to go to our website. Like we have intentionally made it a repository for so much of this information. And there is a a tab on the website that has all of our published research, anything that's that's out there now, and we we continue to update it. Um, So I would say step one is to start there. And then if there are people who are really inclined to try to take the next step, they're welcome to reach out through that website. Um, if they're interested in having like a conversation about what's happening in their communities and if there's any way we can help. We're certainly not the gatekeepers here, so there's no need to to reach out. But if it's helpful, we're we're happy to talk with people. Awesome. And I think if you're already working, if you're already in your community and you're already working towards climate, think about um, getting – getting involved in the movement and, and getting become, becoming a part of our group at Crowd Solving Community and opt in, you know, to our events and um, other, uh, you know, other opportunities that we're creating because I think what communities are finding, and there's a couple of communities, one's in Newton County, one's in Peachtree City, both communities in Georgia that are, were already well on their way, but lacked sort of the backbone that, Drawdown Georgia provides in terms of, of creating, you know, that roadmap or just that spine that kind of holds your whole effort together and gives you some goals that you can really sink your teeth into. You know, it's it's so, it feels so overwhelming, I think, sometimes when you're working on climate, especially if you're a, an individual or a family or a, a community. Um, and even at the state level, I think it's really hard to, to set those priorities. And, and Drawdown Georgia does such a great job of creating that roadmap with those 20 solutions. And so, you know, as a, as a member of a community, you can say, well, gosh, we have, um, you know, we have this composting business. We should see how we can grow that. We have, um, we have, I work for the school board and we know that food waste is a huge issue in school cafeterias. How can we tackle that as a community, not just in my household, but in my community? So I think there's, there's opportunities for individuals, um, but more importantly, opportunities for maybe for um, for communities and organizations and businesses to really look at Drawdown Georgia and get on the road <laughs> and use that map and join the rest of us who are there. Love it. I think I think there's a lot of good nuggets of wisdom there for folks to to get started on their journey. Um, all right, I have a couple more questions for you too and then we'll we'll get to wrap up because i know we're coming up quickly on an hour time is flying um one thing i wanted to ask you about is the goal of drawdown georgia i noticed that the current goal is to reduce emissions by 33 percent by 2030 and i know that the the ipcc has said 
that the world needs to reduce emissions by 50% by 2030 to have a 50% chance of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. So I just wanted to ask both of you, do you know what led the team to choose 33% instead of 50? I'm happy to take this one um, and help you unpack the numbers a little because some of it is a little bit of a technical um, answer. But before I dive into the numbers, I'll just say that we, the way the research was produced is we did not pick an end goal and then back up from there to figure out what climate solutions would hit that goal. Instead, the way it was built was what actually are our best, most promising solutions in Georgia. And then we went through a modeling exercise of if we actually grew those solutions in this state to levels that we found to be both ambitious and achievable, how much carbon would it actually take off the board? So just to get a sense. But the answer to your first question of why 33 versus 50, it's a little bit technical because the answer is we found both. Um, so if you scale those 20 drawdown Georgia solutions to that ambitious but achievable level, mm -hmm. we found that the state's emissions would be about a third lower in 2030 than if we had just continued on the path that we're on. So we estimate that the state's emissions would be about 122 million metric tons in 2030. So this is a projection, right? We haven't gotten to 2030, but we think if things continue, we'll hit yeah. about 122 million metric tons in 2030 if nothing changes, business as usual. If instead we lean into those 20 solutions and we scale them, we think an ambitious but achievable level would get us to about 79 million metric tons in 2030, which is about a third lower. So our 2030 future could be about a third lower. If we took that 79 million metric tons, so that same number, but instead we compared it to where the state was in 2005, which is the baseline that the Paris Accord and the IPCC and other many more other um, political um, climate agreements are set on. So if mm -hmm. you compare that 79, it's actually a 50% reduction. Okay. So in 2030 compared to 2005, which is completely in line with the level of cuts, that was called for under the Paris Agreement. So in this way, it's a little bit semantics about whether it's a 33% reduction in 2030 compared to 2030 or a 50% reduction in 2030 compared to 2005. That is super helpful. But so you, you got to that number, which is aligned with the IPCC, what they're calling for, just looking <laughs> at what you think is possible if you were to be ambitious Correct. and scale these solutions. Correct. And, and just for people to realize, this is not like the technical maximum ability that we think these solutions could achieve. If you actually like put a sol rooftop solar on every single south facing roof in the state and did everything to its technical max, you could actually like go carbon negative. But we, we instead looked at like, what do we think is really both ambitious, but achievable this decade? Like we want to lean in but we also want to get there. Yeah. And that's what that number looks at. That's very cool. Well, I'm, I'm happy to hear both of those that if we really, really leaned in, like who knows, like, I feel like so much has happened just in the past few years in terms of the climate space. Uh, we still need a ton of action, but the conversation at least has come a really long way. So part of me is just hopeful that what seems achievable now could again change pretty dramatically, you know, five years from now. Um, but that's awesome yeah. that what you think is achievable is already aligned with that 50% cut from 2005 levels. And I'll just note that we, we also really want to track how things change. So we agree that this space is really dynamic and that the potential is huge to go further and faster and start reaping some of these benefits of a clean energy future for our state. So um, the Anderson Foundation is supporting kind of a new phase of research. And one of the things that's coming out of that is some researchers at Georgia Tech are building a interactive map that actually will track greenhouse gas emissions in our state so that we can actually see what's happening here in real time. And um, hopefully later this year, we'll be able to, to share that and with the larger community. That is really cool. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it actually, it actually um, 
tracks emissions at the county level with month by month data. And so when that wow. when that's ready to launch, I think it will be a real game changer for for the data story. And and we know that action follows data, right? And and it can help communities set priorities. So the idea that we would have a carbon footprint for our state is interesting. The idea that we could do it by county could be revolutionary, I think. I am definitely going to be keeping an eye out for that. That's really cool. <laughs> um, all right. So one last thing before my, my couple wrap up questions is Lisa already mentioned one earlier on. Uh, I'd love to hear what your favorite co-benefits are um, for these solutions. Which ones are your personal favorites that you have your eye on? You can't pick favorites among your children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's such a, it, it's it, it's all so important. Um, but, you know, anytime we're talking about health and children, you know, so the public health impacts around asthma and allergies, I mean, I think that's, super critical. Um, and I think the equity piece is just one other way that we as um, humans <laughs> can begin to just right the wrongs, you know, is, is let's just not just try, you know, hope that things get better. Um, let's, let's do something really concrete. And if, if we, if we can take equity considerations and make, lift up people who have historically, I mean, particularly, just particularly for Black people in Georgia, who have been historically just left out of the conversation to begin with, and then just negatively impacted by all of the decisions, you know, that, that led us to where we are today. If, if our, if our approach to climate solutions can very intentionally start to right that wrong, then I think that is amazing. And not just, and, and not, there's something, um, so I'm a person with a disability, I use a wheelchair. So there's something about the whole idea that we're not doing this for um, the black community in Georgia, we're doing it with them. It's a very, you know, nothing about me without me is a very common um, consideration in the world of disability. And I think that um, I, I start to see it more and more, those conversations, you know, in in um, thinking about race relations too, is that, you know, it's, this is not a beloved, this is not about being benevolent. This is about, this is about creating a new world. It's, you know, being, approaching it from a perspective of benevolence is exactly how we got here. You know, and that we were, that there was some, you know, sort of, um, system, you know, that, that meant that we could be benevolent or not be benevolent if we choose to. Um, so that is a long winded answer to your question, that that's probably my favorite thing to think about. And I'll just say really tangibly, like we, as we kind of look at how we think these solutions would scale and what it means for these other societal benefits, for the most part, we find them to be like really inspiring and really largely positive, right? So when we look at public health, switching to cleaner fuels and reducing reliance on fossil fuels has major impacts on public health in a really positive way. We know that we would get fine um, par uh, particulate matter out of the air, reducing asthma. We know that if we people did more of a plant-forward diet, that would see health benefits. Um, using mass transit, therefore walking more, has health benefits. Equity doesn't necessarily just scale itself. And so it's really important that we move forward in an intentional way. It's not something that just is going to automatically happen, particularly in Georgia, in the South, or really anywhere. And so for an example, we know that the solar industry is really growing in this state, which is amazing, but it is still overwhelmingly white and overwhelmingly male. Knowing this information, talking about this information and encouraging people to purchase solar from companies that are doing things differently helps to scale solar in a way that is also more equitable. So um, some things the co-benefits are just naturally aligned. I think with equity, it always has to be a North Star. It doesn't scale itself. 
think that's really, really important to keep in mind. Um, final two questions. Thank you all so much already. This has been fantastic. Uh, we'll start with Lisa. What book or books do you recommend or gift to people the most? Well, <laughs> um, and I'm not just saying this, but Ray Anderson's first book, which was called Mint Course Correction, has long been, when you look in my Amazon history, you can see it's been ordered, you know, tens of dozens of times and sent to people. <laughs> and a couple of years ago, we republished it. And John Lanier, his grandson, who runs the foundation, kind of brought it from the time when it was written, which was 1998, forward to today with a few extra chapters. So now I love to share that one. I think it's a how-to and a why-to. And it's just that great story of Ray and, you know, being the capitalist and, and you know, sort of really driven man, shifting all that and pivoting to the sustainability journey was what we called it then, um, is, is one for the ages. I mean, it's just a story people really can, can aspire to. It's officially on my list. Good. What about, <laughs> I'll send it to you. What about you, Blair? <laughs> Please do. Well, you can tell Lisa is like our communicator with an amazing story and I'm way wonkier because <laughs> I'm immediately going to go to say something less inspiring, but really <laughs> exciting to me, um, which is actually not a book. But since we're on a podcast, I'm going to recommend a podcast that I've been listening to this week and just really enjoying. Um, it's called The Big Switch, and it's hosted by Dr. Melissa Lott from Columbia University. And it's a five-part series that digs into some of the challenges and opportunities of moving to a clean electricity system and helps to do a deep dive into the um, the so the uh, winter freeze that happened down in Texas that almost took out their their grid this winter. So it's really well done and really accessible I love and that. A cool way to get up to speed. Very cool. I hadn't heard of that one, so I'm, I'm excited to check that out. And uh, for anyone listening, I'll link to both of those in the show notes so you can find them more easily. Um, final question: Do you have any key? takeaways for folks or final message and that can be for people in georgia or outside of georgia you can take it in whatever whatever direction you want i'm going to start by saying i think my message is no matter what your job is i bet there's an opportunity for you to integrate climate action into what you do and at work like that's what I really love to challenge people is how can you integrate climate action to what you do for work? Can you start a composting at your business? Can you start a food waste program at your company? Um, can you raise your hand for whatever committee is doing some work on this issue? Whatever you do, I bet there's a way that you can engage in climate action. And I'll piggyback on that, which is, um, you know, as we have been going around and talking to people about Drawdown Georgia, people often say, like, what can I do? Um, and what I always tell people is, like, one, you should think about your own carbon impact. It is what I like to think of as, like, necessary but not sufficient to meet the challenge at hand. But that doesn't mean it's not necessary. And then you should think, like Lisa was saying, about what is that largest lever of change that you personally interact with? Maybe it's your church. Maybe it is your school. Maybe it is your job. Maybe you want to lobby on a state or federal level. Like where do you see this larger than self opportunity? And I think we will all surprise ourselves by knowing that like we can make a difference by reaching there. So starting at home, but reaching to where, to where your community lies. And for people in Georgia, when they think about like what would it mean to reach, I hope they look to, to our solutions for – for vetted opportunities that we know work here at home. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, this has been amazing. Uh, thank you both for coming on the show and your time and all the important work that you and the team are doing over at Drawdown Georgia. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks. This was great.